Please be seated. Once again, good morning. We're continuing our verse-by-verse study through the Gospel of John, so would you please now turn to John chapter 9, please. John chapter 9. Have you ever had God ask you to do something that you didn't really want to do? We see this throughout the Bible, actually. Abraham and Isaac up on Mount Moriah in Genesis 22. Or how about the prophet Ezekiel, whom God told him to lay on his side for 390 days, then told him to make a meal with fuel from cow feces. How about Jeremiah the prophet, who had to bear a large yoke in town for everyone to see, symbolizing God's judgment upon the nation and the upcoming Babylonian captivity. Hosea, God asked him to marry a harlot as a picture of Israel's unfaithfulness. And we see this theme throughout the scriptures. We see it in the New Testament as well. How about the man at Gadara who Jesus healed of demonic possession and cast the demons into swine, you recall. And the man from Gadara said, Jesus, I want to follow you. And you remember what Jesus said? He said, no, you need to go back home and tell everyone what God has done. I share all of that because to a very small portion, I can relate this morning. See, the section of Scripture in John chapter 9 is probably the most impactful verses in the entire Bible to me personally in my life. And the Lord has told me to share that with you this morning as part of our study. Because this all revolves around the question, the age-old question of why. The question that has haunted humanity since the sin in the Garden of Eden, why the trials? Why the heartache? Why the travesties? And that's what we're going to deal with this morning. We're only going to study verses 1 through 7. And the title of this morning's message is The Proper Perspective. If I could ask you to stand with me one more time, let's read the first three verses together of God's holy word. John chapter 9 verses 1 through 3. It says, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Let's pray. Father, we're here because we need your word to transform us. Lord, we ask that the Holy Spirit would speak to each and every one of us in a powerful way through your word this morning. Father, we're here with surrendered hearts, with humbled hearts. Lord, we desperately need you. So, Father, speak to us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. If you've been attending here for some years, you've heard some of the story that I'm about to share. And it's really the story of how Kim and I came here to Cincinnati. See, it's been nine years. Can you believe, Kim, it's been nine years now we've been in Cincinnati. We're from Rochester, New York. And at the time, my kids were one and two years old, and I was in the business world, and was asked to come to Cincinnati for a very large promotion. I was being promoted to be the vice president of the Fortune 500 Corporation and president of the subsidiary organization. And I was told that I had one year to fix the subsidiary organization or else the mothership, the parent company, was going to shut it all down. (laughs) Gulp, no pressure, right? 
But the Lord had confirmed over and over again through his word and some other things to Kim and I that it was his will that we leave all of our friends and family and our life in New York to come to Cincinnati. It was a city none of us had ever been to. I didn't even know where it was. I got here and I'm like, we're so close to Kentucky. This is nuts. I didn't know. In those first 60 days were... I can only describe as pure chaos in Bedlam. See, Kim is back in Rochester with our, again, our one and our two-year-old, trying to get the house ready to sell. I'm flying back here and flying back home every weekend to see them for like a day and a half and say, hi, bye, and I'm trying to turn around the company. I got hit by a semi, all these crazy things, and the company was going downhill fast, so I was firing everybody and their brother. A lot of harassment and not good things were going on there, so I had to come in there and kind of clean house. Bedlam. But we finally got our house in Milford where we used to live and took the week off from work and we're moving into the house and, you know, this is it. This is the time of excitement. Our new lives have begun. And on Jan, excuse me, June 16th of 2012, at 1.23 a.m., I got the call. Some of you in here know what it's like to get the call in the middle of the night. Nothing good happens when you get that middle of the night phone call, does it? And it was my dad. See, years before, when I was 21, my mom had died. So it was my dad, my brother, my sister, and myself kind of left in the family. And you know, now I'm moving eight hours away, so they kind of feel like they just lost me. And my dad called, and he said that Jarrett was, my brother, was riding his motorcycle, his Harley. Now, you got to understand, my brother was a very large, built, muscular construction worker. You can see the resemblance clearly, can't you? Why are you laughing? But he was, a, he was a different kind of guy. Again, always rode his motorcycle, had a concealed carry, kept on him all the time. But he was riding his motorcycle. And a car had broken down on a somewhat quiet country road. And my brother didn't see it. And so as my dad began to tell me this, I'm already in my mind's eye thinking, oh no, jerk got in an accident. And my brother hit this broken down vehicle on his motorcycle and went flying. An off-duty EMT worker was having a campfire. It was 10.30 at night, and he heard the wreck. Interesting that this off-duty EMT worker used to drive me in my school bus as a kid. But he hears the accident, and he hops on his four-wheeler and drives down, calls 911 shines a flashlight, and he sees my brother's body laying in the road. So now I'm thinking, oh my gosh, my brother is dead. The EMT worker, his name was Kenny, shines his flashlight to see if there's any more victims. He doesn't know that's what you're trained to do. And as he's looking for other victims, about seven other cars had stopped at that time because it was, in fact, blocking the road. And he didn't see another victim, so he turned back to where my brother's body was laying. And my brother wasn't there. And he turns, and my brother is standing up, like almost nose to nose, eyes as wide as saucers, clearly in shock. And the EMT worker, Kenny, he's kind of taken aback, and he says, hey, man, sit down, sit down, relax. Like, we call 911, they're going to be here. Just sit down and relax. And my brother looked at him intently for a moment, and he gave him the man hug. Guys, you know what the man hug is, right? Like, you, you shake their hand, you bring them in, and you're patting them on the back, right? Like, I'm hugging you, but I'm hitting you, so it's okay because I'm a man, right? You, you get what I'm saying. And he gave Kenny the, the hug, and Kenny's like, yeah, man, my brother says, thank you, thank you. And he's like, yeah, relax, relax. And Kenny, the EMT worker, takes two steps away. So as my dad is telling me this, I'm like, okay, I thought Jarrett was dead, but he's in an accident, so he's okay. 
And as the EMT worker turns and takes two steps, my brother then reaches in and pulls out his gun and shoots himself in the head in front of everyone. And I go, what? My dad goes, yeah. Jared just killed himself. Now listen, this is not how our new life in Cincinnati is supposed to go. So I tell Kim, I go, hey, George just killed himself. I got to go bury my brother. We still have boxes everywhere. You know what it's like to move, right? Boxes stay stacked. The kids are one and two. I'm like, I got to go. It's an eight-hour drive to get to his house. There was no suicide note. He wasn't married, no clue, no indication. In fact, that Saturday, June 16th, was the day right before Father's Day. He and my dad had spent all morning together. My dad and my brother were best friends. They hung out all the time. And then this? So now I'm driving. Eight hours is a long time to think. I've had to do some difficult things in my life. That may be at the top of the list of hardest things I've ever had to do. And I'm weeping and crying and praying like, Lord, how do you even explain such a circumstance? And it was at some point as I was driving that I made a, essentially a covenant with God in my heart. You see, that set of circumstances is so bizarre. I knew that I would never know the reason why. There was no indicators. He wasn't suicide. Nothing like that. Just gone. So I knew I'd never know why. But I prayed and I said, Lord, I know I'll never know why. The question is not why. The question is how. How can I use this, God, for your glory? And I made a covenant in my heart that day before the Lord. And I haven't really thought about why ever since. But it has been my goal, my mission, my vision of speaking to others, and I cannot tell you how many times the Lord has brought someone to me who's thinking about suicide. A couple of circumstances where that day they were getting ready to commit suicide, and I've been able to minister to them and point them to the lies of Satan and the truth of Jesus. All about the question of why. Since the fall of humanity in the Garden of Eden, no question has been on the tip of humanity's tongue like that question of why. It's a question that has been repeated over and over again throughout the ages as trials and calamities and injustices befall all people. And I'm sure that every one of you here this morning has your own gut-wrenching and soul-searching experience that led you to question and cry out to God, why? Why does God allow these things in our lives? This morning, we will see how Jesus responded to the question of why 2,000 years ago and how it's applicable to us today. So let's dig in. Verse 1, would you read it with me, please? Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. All right, if you were here last week in John 8, do you remember how John chapter 8 ended? Remember, Jesus had just declared that he is the I am. You remember that? Look up on your screen at John 8, 58. It says, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them 
and so passed by. So chapter 8 ends with, remember we talked about like, like Jesus putting on the invisibility cloak, right? Like, zoop, gone, he just passes through the midst. But notice with me what John 9, 1 says, that Jesus was again passing by. And here, they're at the location called the Pool of Siloam. If you're heading to Israel with us next year, we will take you to this location. The distance from this Pool of Siloam to the Temple Mount where Jesus just finished his teaching in John chapter 8 is less than a mile. It's a pretty short journey. But notice with me that we never read of Jesus running around in a panic, do we? We don't ever read that Jesus was shook up or frazzled about the events that happened. Remember, slanders, insulters, and guys who were plotting his murder surrounded him, but none of it shook Jesus. Why? Because he remained steadfast in his determination to serve the Father's will. No matter what circumstances may happen. And isn't that a wonderful example for us to live by? To be obedient to our Father's will, no matter what the circumstances may be around us? So verse 1 tells us that they're walking, and they come across a blind man. Now, in those days, much like today, people who were beggars or had debilitating disabilities would claim a spot along a well-traveled street leading to the temple. And this is still a common sight today. And while this blind man undoubtedly joined many others who were there begging and asking, this guy, drew the disciples' attention more than any other beggar for one reason. And look what verse 1 says. Because he was born blind. His disability was congenital. It wasn't the result of a disease or injury. He was always born this way. So try to imagine the scene in your mind's eye for a moment. This beggar would be well known in his community because of his blindness. And his begging for alms would have made him a notable figure all around the temple for years, perhaps even decades. And because of this, you can be sure that the Pharisees judged him and the Sadducees ignored him. Sure, I bet some worshipers showed compassion, while still other worshipers would walk by, tiptoe, clutching their wallets close so as not to have to be bothered with the whole thing. Read verse 2. And his disciples asked Jesus, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Remember, we're in the last six months of Jesus' earthly ministry. The disciples have already seen incredible, unfathomable miracles take place, right? They've seen Jesus walk on the water, Jesus calm the waves, Jesus feed the 5,000, have them, you know, casting out demons and even healing the blind. And so now as they're walking, the disciples see this beggar, and one of them decides to ask the hardest question. The question of why. The disciples saw the man and thought of assigning blame. Who can we condemn for this condition? But in defense of the disciples, they were only reflecting the common understanding of disease and suffering among the Jews in those days. See, the Jewish rabbis taught that every illness and natural disaster was caused by some person's specific sin. The rabbis taught that sin and suffering supposedly had a cause and effect type of relationship. The thinking was that the tornadoes touched down on the evildoers. That cancer would only strike the carnal. 
that heart attacks only happen to heathen and forest fires destroy the faithless. You get the point. One Jewish rabbi commented, quote, there is no death without sin and there is no suffering without iniquity. Other rabbis took this erroneous thinking even further. They taught that a child could sin in utero, in the womb, and they would be punished with a deformity. And yet even a few other Jewish rabbis went to a further extreme. They declared that if a child was born with a disorder like blindness, it had to be the result of the parent's sin. Here, Jesus' disciples are merely echoing the flawed theological philosophies of that day. And their belief was that someone, somebody, had to be held accountable for the tragic circumstance of this man's life. Surely, someone had to be to blame. And really, those beliefs weren't all that new. In fact, those beliefs have been held for countless generations. Have you ever read the book of Job and Job's three friends? They subscribe to this exact thinking. So what is Jesus' response to the age-old question of why? Are you ready? You're not going to like it. Verse 3. Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Birth defects and other similar tragedies are sometimes due to the sinful behavior of the parents. We see the impacts that drug abuse has on newborns who have to suffer through the pain of withdrawal. That's real. Yet, Far more often, and in the case of our text here, the tragic circumstances folks find themselves are not a result of a direct sin of that person or their parents. It's a sinful world in which we live in today, isn't it? And here in verse 3, Jesus shoots down the theology of the rabbis. Birth defects, incurable illnesses, natural disasters can't be pinned on a specific sin. They may not be due to any particular sin at all. When sin entered the world, the whole created order fell into futility. It's what theologians call the fall. When sin occurred in Genesis chapter 3. Suffering is now the fallout of the fall. But the real question isn't who caused the misery or what caused these circumstances. Rather, the question is, will we allow God to use it for his glory, just as Jesus says here in verse 3? In his commentary on the book of Job, Frank Anderson writes, quote, the Bible explains suffering not so much in origins as in goals. The purpose of pain is seen not in its cause but in its results. The man was born blind so that the works of God could be displayed in him. The disciples asked Jesus, why is this man born blind? In essence, Jesus says it doesn't matter. What counts is how God is going to use the situation to bring himself glory. Now, we'll see in a few minutes how this plays out. You likely know that Jesus does, in fact, heal the man of his blindness. But look carefully, please, at verse 3. For the word there is works. It's not work. Works. Plural. A healing is a work, a one-time work. No, Jesus says that the works of God. This is much more than just the healing of this man's physical ailment. Let's read verse 3 and 4 together. Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. 
The night is coming when no one can work. Instead of focusing on the blind beggar as some sort of theological pretzel that needed to be untangled, Jesus saw this man as an opportunity to display the works of God. And notice Jesus sensed an urgency to do this while it was still day, meaning the time of his earthly ministry. C.H. Spurgeon, you've likely heard of him before, he's referred to as the Prince of Preachers. He said this, let me quote, Let us, then, be less inquisitive and more practical, less for cracking doctrinal nuts and more for bringing forth the bread of life to starving multitudes. I can't personally agree more. You see, when the struggles happen in our lives or the friends and families we love, when the calamity happens, when the tragedy occurs, we are all faced with a choice. We can sit there and try to unwind and dissect the why, or we could say here is an opening for God's almighty love to be applied. Here's a chance for the grace and goodness of God. But we have to choose. Would you look at the end of verse 4 with me one more time, please? Jesus says the night is coming when no one can work. Jesus is explaining that opportunities for service and doing good don't last forever. When we're in heaven, there will be no helping the poor or witnessing to the lost or encouraging the downtrodden. That means while we're here on this earth as pilgrims, as sojourners, I love how 1 Peter describes it, throughout your stay here, like we're hotel room guests, While we're here, this is the only chance we have to show the love of God to others. You know, one of the marks of Jesus' ministry was his sense of urgency. We know that each day begins and ends. The sun rises and the sun sets. And likewise, the plans of God have a start and they have a finish. And when the sun goes down on that last day, all that are not saved will not be saved. This is why, like Jesus, we need to be busy doing the works of God. Works of compassion and mercy and forgiveness and reconciliation and of love. George Mueller, many of you know about George Mueller. He put it all in perspective by saying, quote, When the day of recompense comes, our only regret will be that we have done so little for him. Not that we have done too much. Folks, it's daytime now, but the night is coming. At the beginning of the Civil War, General George McClellan was the commander of the Yankee troops. And McClellan was by his nature a very overly cautious man. And for months, he refused to move his troops into battle. His inactivity angered and frustrated Abraham Lincoln. Finally, Lincoln wrote him, quote, My dear McClellan, if you don't want to use the army, I'd like to borrow them for a while. Respectfully yours, Abraham Lincoln. Just as Jesus showed a sense of urgency, one of the tragedies of Christianity today is the lack of a sense of urgency to be about our Father's business. We all need a sense of urgency in our walk and in our witness for Christ. Verse 5, Jesus says, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, we saw last week in chapter 8 how Jesus, after the amazing mercy that he showed to the woman caught in the act of adultery, how Jesus declared that he is the light of the world. Look at John 8, 12 up on your screen. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. 
Jesus is the light. Jesus is the light of the world. Yet, he has also called you and I to project his light into this dark world, hasn't he? Matthew 5, 16 tells us. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give you the glory. Is that what it says? Just want to make sure you're paying attention. No. That they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. How's your light been shining lately? Are we reflecting truly the light of Jesus Christ? Is it shining bright out of us for all to see? At the feet of this poor, desperate beggar, the disciples missed an amazing, perhaps we could say even glorious opportunity. The opportunity to minister to this man, to encourage this man, to love this blind, blind man in the name of Christ. And this gives us a very humbling warning to every Christian today. One of the greatest dangers of being a Christian is when our desires are greater than the needs of others. I want to say that again. One of the most dangerous places, if not the most dangerous place to be as a Christian, is when our desires are greater than the needs of of others because then it's really all about us verse 6 when jesus had said these things he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay this is a pretty bizarre way to heal a man isn't it now, there are countless theories and speculations as to why Jesus spat on the ground and made clay, but there's too many of them to mention here, but I encourage you, to, you can do some studies on that in your leisure time. There's, you know, theories about how man comes from dust and the Lord was using that or healing from the blindness of sin, all those types of things. But we know from the scriptures that Jesus healed many who were physically blind and he didn't spit on the ground and rub mud in their eyes, did he? Jesus healed blind Bartimaeus. Look up on your screen at Mar excuse me, Mark 10. It says, So Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. But then in Bethsaida, back in Mark 8, we see another bizarre way. Look up on your screen again. Then he came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him, and he begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up, and he was restored and saw everyone clearly. Now, wait a second. In Mark 10... Jesus just speaks a word, and the blind man gains a sight. In Mark 8, it appears that Jesus spits in the guy's eyes. And here in John 9, Jesus spits on the, crown, makes it on the ground, makes some mud, and covers the guy's eyes. If you were to be healed of blindness, which method would you choose? See, and that's the point. Throughout the Bible, we see that Jesus always changed his methods of healing. Why? So that no one could ever make a formula of the methods. Because there is no power in the method. The power comes from God Almighty. We're going to end our study in verse 7 this morning. Read it with me, please. And Jesus said to him, Go. Wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. So this blind man has his eyes caked with mud. And Jesus says, go into the pool of Siloam and rinse off. And the man does and is now healed. But notice with this miracle 
that Jesus came to the blind man. The blind man did not come to Jesus, did he? But even with that fact, Jesus expected the blind man to respond with faith-filled action. The man had to respond to the voice of God to get the blessing. The healing would not happen unless the man responded to those faith-filled actions. And the same is true of us. When God asks us to step out in faith, we need to respond. We need to be obedient to get the blessing. Now we'll resume the rest of chapter 9, not next Sunday, because that's Resurrection Sunday. So two weeks from now, we'll see the rest of the account because there is so much more to the story of this man. And I encourage you to read the rest of John 9 today to see what happens. But notice with me that Jesus never explained why this man suffered all of his life. Jesus simply responded that it was an opportunity for God to be glorified. It makes me wonder, personally, how many times this man as a little boy cried out to his mom, why am I born blind? Why me? I wonder if there's anyone in this room or perhaps watching or listening who is being held hostage today by the question of why. The Bible tells us in Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Clearly, not everything that happens to us is good, is it? But rather, all things work together for good. Think of it this morning like baking a cake. You have to get a bunch of ingredients, right? You get flour and sugar and shortening and eggs and vanilla extract, all those things. Now, those ingredients in of themselves are not very tasty, are they? I don't think anyone here is carrying around a packet of flour and says, you know what? I need a little flour to get me through the day. Hey, you have vanilla extract. Can I have some of that? That's not happening. If it is, we probably need to talk. But when you mix all of the ingredients together and you put it under enough heat for a long enough period of time, you get the cake. When tragedy and hardship make an unexpected arrival in your life, how will you respond? Look at Job's response in Job 23.10 with me. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot has held fast to his steps. I have kept his way and not turned aside. I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. I find it amazing and even a little bit frustrating that the word of God spends so much time on genealogies. And yet God only gives us five words for the creation of stars. And he created the stars also. Nowhere does he tell us the why. Because it all comes down to faith. Do we trust that he is God, even in our darkest moments? Do we trust that he will use our tragedies for his glory? I'll leave you with Hebrews eleven six 6 this morning. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. How's your faith today? Is it growing? 
So you can't have faith without trust. And you can't have trust without a real relationship. And you cannot have a real relationship without investing gobs of time. And that's where the rubber meets the road, ladies and gentlemen. You will never find the time to read the Bible, will you? There's always more pressing things that we've got to do. You have to make the time. It has to be a priority. And you may come to church. We're going to do our best to feed you the word of God every chance we can. But this is just the icing on the cake. The real growth comes from you in the word and the Holy Spirit speaking to you because he is God. He is the perfect teacher. I'm going to mess up. Y'all know that. The real growth is when it's you and the quietness of your place in Almighty God. And I want to tell you beware because if you are not willing to sacrifice whatever needs to be sacrificed, To make that time, your faith is going to fail. I pray you spend time in the word. Read your Bibles. Ask the Lord to speak to you. Make the time. He's so faithful, isn't he? Let's bow our heads as we close. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would just continue to search our hearts. Lord, we are so empty apart from you. Father, if there is anyone here today whose faith is failing, I pray right now you would remind them of your love for them. And Lord, they would do what it takes to have that real relationship with you, that trust, that abiding together, that close-knit communion with you as their creator and their father who loves them. Lord, we thank you for your mercy upon us. We thank you for your kindness. Lord, I pray that you would use us in the tragedies and the circumstances that we've all endured and those things that we have yet to endure. Father, I pray that we would seek to use those for your glory alone. We ask this in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, we still have some coffee and some bagels over there, open hand.